So this is chapter two in our textbook, which is Lois Roman's um, CT, Computed Tomography for Technologists. And I'm realizing now, too, I don't have my textbook right in front of me, which makes me really nervous. Now, now I'm getting nervous again. <laughs> Let me allude to how nervous I am right now. Um, so our objectives, we need to identify all the parts of the CT scanner. So we got some labeling for parts, which is always good news for students because we're basically just labeling parts, right, and defining what those parts do. Um, so how this hardware and software integrate to form this giant Terminator robot that we call a CT scanner. Because if you see the thing, like naked, without its plastic on, woo, that thing is scary looking. Has anyone seen it? It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger after, after he's been hit by a few hand grenades or something. It's intense. Like a transformer in the midst of transforming. That's the way it looks. Um, if you can imagine this giant meat grinder spinning around you at 100, roughly 100 ro rotations per minute. That's what you got behind the plastic. So we'll look at that closely in a second. We'll talk about scanner generation, kind of brief history of CT development. Why, why is it important? What to remember about that? How to zero the table? And I used to have people do the desk cat thing. I've put it out here just because it's there if you want it. I have a, I have a, a CT simulator that we'll, we'll use it. We'll, we should get an opportunity to use it some this summer. But if in the midst of talking about this hardware and software, you're like, I still don't know what this dude's alluding to all the time, um, but it's making me nervous. Uh, you, can, you can do a CT scan here on campus, right? And I, yes. There, I have a CT simulator. It's in, it's in the classroom. You can it does everything a CT scanner does, right? It does not use radiation though. It uses light. You can put the micro. It's like you actually these little gummy bears. Oh, yeah. seriously? I'm serious. And it makes axial projections of them, and you can do uh, 3D reformats. And Tom Tom dropped it, so I haven't energized it since Tom dropped it. But um, yes, I do have that. It is there. So if you're more of a hands-on learner, it's there, right? I used to have a lab embedded in this class. I took it out, but I want I put this in here as a reminder. It's there. So if you're a more hands-on person, please just shoot me an email. I will. Be glad to meet you in the classroom and, and with your friends or whatever and, and, and see how the CT scanner works, right? So just out of curiosity, show of hands, who here has had a chance to do a CT scan at this point? Not quite half of us, right? Um, so look around the room, see those people who have who've had a chance to be around the CT scanner and buddy up with them a little bit too, right? Because I don't want us to get lost. This tech, technology that we're talking about Pretty straightforward. This is what it looks like when you take the plastic off. Um, a lot of it is um, uh, cooling mechanisms, uh, but the technology that we're going to look at is going to be the slip rings, which you can't really see on this image here, but they're basically what allows this thing to have kilovoltage of power passing through it and yet continue to spin. That was one of the first engineering hurdles they needed to overcome to design this machine was to figure out a way to allow it to rotate while it was continuing to receive power. And the design initially came from NASA, that they need, NASA needed a way to continually provide power to space shuttles while they disengaged booster rockets, right? Um, and so they, we borrowed that technology from, from the space program. It has a generator on board, right? So it has a generator in the room, it also has a generator on board. Um, if you can picture that. Anyone who's ever played with a power generator, this thing is spinning a power generator around you, right? Um, it has a, a huge cooling system. In fact, we can kind of see um, along this bank right here, all of these things right here are cooling fans, right? Um, that's on the side of the image receptor. And then over here, that's the x-ray tube. There's almost like um, air conditioning type units around the x-ray tube because it's producing a tremendous amount of heat. Um, it has filtration systems, collimators, and detectors. This machine is using what we would call a fan beam of x-rays, so we can see these divergent lines here around that X. That X is, any guess what that S X is? Therapy folks, anyone? That's the isocenter of the machine. So this is the point at, around which it's spinning. That's isocenter, right? Um, and it's got this fan of x-rays that are coming out from the tube, and it's hitting this curved bank of detectors 
and that's what's picking up the remnant beam exiting the patient. So that's the nuts and bolts of this giant robot. But let's um, talk about why, why we've got these things and what they do. So the first off, slip rings, they're allowing this thing to spin around and they make the helical scan modes possible. So I said that if axial mode is like getting bread slices, what did I compare helical scanning to? Remember, it was a food thing. The honey-baked ham. So helical is the honey-baked spiral cut, right? Yeah. So because it can spin continuously, we can also move the table through continuously. We can get this spiral slice. So the, we need the slip rings for that. That'll become, we'll come back to that when we talk about the history of the development here. We need a generator. So this is going to provide high voltage power for x-ray photons. Um, so we want to increase the voltage into the kilovolt range using transformers to, in order to increase the energy range of the x-ray beam. We need what's something in the diagnostic range of energies. In the diagnostic range of energies, I've largely defined as that range of energies where the photoelectric interaction can occur. We need cooling systems because largely this x-ray tube is just a giant toaster, right? It makes a ton of heat. Like over 99% 90, of what it's producing is heat. Um, and, uh, and then a small portion of that is x-rays as well. So we have to cool the thing or else it would literally just melt. Um, so we have blowers, filters, um, all sorts of devices used to dissipate the excess heat. And the machine does heat up, trust me, like when you've, when you've done a few CT scans, that room gets hot. Filtration. Um, so we're going to use filtration a lot. We're going to use this term interchangeably. So this, if there's a frustrating term in this presentation, filtration might win the, win the prize. So the way when it's just filtration, just like this, um, this is used to reduce patient dose. So we're going to place things um, after the x-ray tube. As the x-rays are exiting the x-ray tube, we're going to place filters in the path of the x-ray tube to get rid of the weak x-rays. They get rid of those weak x-rays that would just ionize the patient's skin. And so essentially this filtration is hardening the beam. It's making the average energy of the x-ray beam higher. The average energy of the x-ray beam will increase. The number of x-rays in that beam will decrease because we're getting rid of the weak ones. So that's why we refer to it as hardening the beam. Um, he talks about it as well in the reading packet that I gave you that as we increase filtration, we, the x-rays that are high powered, they'll just pass through that filtration. It doesn't bother them at all, right? The weak ones are stopped by it. Um, the way that I think about it, this is kind of crass, but I, I, I think about like the, the guys that can crush the beer cans against their heads, they can crush beer cans against their heads all day long. It does not bother them at all, right? The guys like me who cannot crush beer cans against our heads, one beer can is going to knock us out, right? The reason I think about it that way is beer cans are aluminum and these filters are aluminum, right? So the hard x-rays, the tough ones, they can pass through aluminum all day long. It does not stop them at all. The weak guys, they get knocked out by one beer can, right? Um, this is going to reduce the patient's skin dose on the area that the x-rays are striking the surface of their skin. It reduces the patient's skin dose. Um, and it also minimizes beam hardening artifacts on the image. So those streaks that appear on the image, it can get rid of those as well. That is one form of filtration. Now I mentioned that this is one of those confusing terms. So there's two other ways that I will talk about filtration in this class. The other way is what we would call um, compensating filtration. <coughs> compensating filtration compensates for the contours of the patient's body. So a bow tie filter is a compensating filter, right? And this bow tie filter shapes the x-ray beam to that hot dog shape of the patient's body. It minimizes the amount of x-rays on the outsides while allowing for an equal number of x-rays on the inside, a sufficient number of x-rays on the, on the inside, I should say, because it's shaped like a bow tie. So the outsides of it are thick, it stops more x-rays, the inside is thin, it stops less x-rays, right? So it's shaping it. We do that all the time in radiation. We're always doing some form of compensating filtration and, extra, and radiation therapy. 
um, either by using multi-leaf collimators or, or whatever, um, dynamic wedges, we are shaping the x-ray beam. So that should be easy for us to wrap our brains around for, as therapists, for the x-ray techs and others in the room. Um, we will do some activities to make sure we're real, real solid on that. Okay, so that's the second way I will use it, as compensating filtration, right? The bow tie filter. The third way that I will refer to filtration is a software function. Filtration as a software function. So, for example, one of the ways that we process CT information is called filtered back projection. Filtered back projection. It is a form of software filtering. Right? Um, so we, just so you know, this is a, a point where we want to be real clear on the terms that we use. Like for, so on the tests and stuff, I will say filtration if I just mean this, that reduces patient dose. I will say compensating filtration if I'm talking about things like bow tie filters. And I will say um, software filtration if I'm talking about some kind of software process. Okay? So I'll be trying to be really careful about, or I'll give you hints within the context of the sentence that he's talking about software, he's talking about compensation. So make sure you read the questions carefully when it's a filtration question. Collimation. Um, so this is going to restrict the x-ray beam to just a specific area. Sometimes we call that the field of view or the region of interest, right? Um, it will reduce the scatter radiation. So when we cone down or when we collimate in, we are reducing the area that we're x-raying, and so we're reducing the amount of scatter that could be produced. Additionally, collimators have built into them certain um, leafs or lenses, I guess leafs is probably the right word. They have lead shutters on them that also cut out some of the off-focus radiation produced by the x-ray tube. Um, but if you just remember that they reduce scatter radiation, that's sufficient. This will improve image contrast because um, scatter hates you and it wants to destroy the image contrast. So if we get rid of scatter, we are improving image contrast. Those two are like two sides of the same coin. And it decreases the patient dose. But just coning into the air, collimating to the area of interest, the anatomy of interest, we are reducing patient dose. So in my mind, when I'm thinking about all this stuff, there's all these up arrows and down arrows in my brain, right? Like, KVP goes up, right? Um, so I see the up arrow, then that means like energy goes up, penetrability goes up, um, patient dose, interestingly enough, goes down, right? So I've got all these up and down arrows in my mind. Um, start to organize your thoughts in those ways um, because all of this stuff interrelates. Detectors, um, these are gonna collect the information regarding the degree to which each anatomic structure is attenuated by the beam. So they're, they're basically capturing the remnant beam, right? And they are detecting both what we had to start with and what remains, right? Um, this is one of the reasons, for example, in nuclear medicine we're able to use this for attenuation correction, right? They are able to do that kind of statistical analysis, what we had and what remained. And so, these are generally made out of some kind of solid state crystal. So similar to nuclear medicine, we're also really into our crystals, right? Um, what kind of detector crystal are we using? Now, this stuff has gotten really space age, and I have no clue what weird wizard cave they're growing these crystals in, but I would love to visit it someday. Like I picture it being guarded by a dragon. But um, these crystals, I have no clue what kind of crystals they're using anymore. In the bat, and back in the good old days, they used xenon gas, right? But Pretty much no one's using that anymore. Um, almost all that we're using now is solid state crystal. So here is the layout of that hardware, and the way it integrates with the software is, is kind of laying out in this in the slide. So, and I like this this depiction here, um, kind of side by side, because on the one side we kind of have the hardware shifting into software. So on this left hand side we've got the x-ray tube, the beam striking the patient, it's striking the detector, it's being turned into an electrical signal, that's an analog electrical signal, it's being converted to digital by the ADC, right? Um, we have that digital signal that's then processed by the computer. So pretty much everything from here to here is what we're going to, our textbook's going to refer to as the DAS, right? The digital acquisition system. 
Um, on this other side, so this is a depiction of software in essence right here, how the software integrates. This over here is showing us all the hardware, the way the hardware works. Um, and uh, so we'll look at that. We'll label this diagram at some point so we can orient ourselves to all these different pieces. All right, switching gears just a little bit, we need to talk about scanner generation because it's helpful to know how these machines are being designed. So scanner generation refers to the configuration of the x-ray tube and the detector, right? The third generation design is the most widely used today. Pretty much everything I've ever worked on was a third generation scanner, right? Um, and there is a fourth generation, but it's actually like, uh, let's pretend like that didn't happen, just go back to the third. It's, it's kind of like the Star Wars movies they made later on. Um, it's like, let's pretend that didn't happen. Um, okay, so here's the first generation. Now you may be wondering, what the heck's going on in here? Um, so in this generation, we've got this x-ray tube. That's this weird wonky thing at the top, right? And legit one detector. Just one detector. So the way this worked is the x-ray tubes make an x-rays in like a like a single line, basically. Or even they use like an Americanium source, they use a radioisotope, and you have one detector and it scans across the patient like this. Right? And then it moves and it scans and it moves and it scans and it moves and it scans. Right? That's the mechanism that's referred to here. So this is the patient's hot dog shaped body right here in the accident plane. So we've got the gantry aperture, isocenter would be right about there, and this is the way this thing is scanning. First generation. You might be thinking, wow, it's a really dumb design. It was, um, but it was all they could do with the technology they had at that time. Slip rings had not been invented yet, right? So this is what they could do with the, the power sources that they had. So that's first generation. Second generation. We improved by increasing the patient's dose. So now we're using a fan beam of detectors, um, with a fan beam of x-rays with multiple detectors, but we're still doing that crazy scanning thing, like this bad robot dance, right? Because again, they don't have the power to supply this thing spinach, right? That's what they want, but the engineering is not there yet. This is third generation, and this is the one that you will mostly be working on. So in this case, we, again, we still have the fan beam of x-rays being produced, and we have this bank of detectors that are roughly contoured to the inside of the gantry. This entire thing spins around because we now have slip ring technology. So both the detector and the tube are spinning at the same rate, right? Um, it looks like our textbook just kind of skips over fourth generation, so I wouldn't even worry about it. The fourth generation thing got a little crazy, right? <coughs> They're like, let's put detectors around the whole insides and just spin the tube, right? Interesting, but what happens if like one detector goes out? That's really expensive to replace. Like you're getting the whole machine's now no, no good, right? Um, so what we've we skipped a generations and now. Probably the only generational thing I can think of that's of any use to us is dual source, right? So dual source is using x-rays of two different energies, right? Like a low KVP x-ray is being produced by one x-ray tube and a high KVP x-ray is being produced by the other x-ray tube. And between those two different KVPs, we can now do some densitrometry, right? similar to spectroscopy that we do in nuclear medicine. We can look at the spectrum of attenuations that are occurring inside the patient. Why would we be interested in that? Well, some, this allows us to do spectral analysis of anatomy. So for example, there's something on the patient's leg. I'm not sure what it is. Is it cancer? Is it gout, right? We can do spectral analysis and say, yes, it's primarily uric acid, that is this type of gout. So we can even define what type of gout is because we're an analyzing the spectrum of energies of attenuation, right? Pretty nerdy stuff, I won't lie. Um, but it does show some promise in a number of oncology applications and 
you know, bony anatomy applications. It can help us determine what kind of kidney stone do you have, what kind of gallstone is that, um, those types of parsing out, okay, we know it's a gallstone, but what's it made out of, right? That's, what, that's the main promise of dual source. Um, it could potentially also decrease scan time, but it generally increases patient dose for obvious reasons. You're frying them twice. One thing I want to point out um, is box two, three in your textbook. I don't have mine with me. It is wrong, exclamation point. Um, this is a point of controversy. And we will find, point, this is not like any slight against the textbook writer. We will find points of controversy in our reading. And I checked, it's the same for both textbooks. They're both wrong. Um, and, but I don't have my textbook with me. So will someone please read what it says? So it says two things. High KVP somehow manages to increase patient dose, but it reduces heat load, right? Is that what it says? Does it say reduce heat load? What does yours say? Okay, so we'll just X that out. It's either wrong or conflicting. This data acquisition system or DAS, right? So this is a software part of the system. Pretty much everything we've talked about up to this point has been hardware. This is software, meaning it's computer stuff. It's an app. Um, but it's a lot of apps working together. So this is going to measure the photons that pass through the patient, strike the detectors. It converts that to an analog signal, and then it converts that to a digital signal, right? Um, and it's going to be inside the detector, inside the gantry, near the detectors, because it wants to rapidly convert that system so there's no information lost in transit. Okay, one of the last things we want to think about is the actual patient table. Now, it may seem like a really kind of lackluster thing, but actually these tables are incredibly complex and very precise pieces of machinery. So one of the things I want to stress is, number one, how powerful this machine is for patient imaging, but also how fragile it is at the same time. Like it's got crystals inside of it, it's uh, susceptible to overheating, and one of the best things you can do as an x-ray tech, or CT tech, I should say, is to keep your room clean. That, that, that's really true for all of us, regardless of where we wind up in allied health. Keep your place spotless. Be that person that makes sure everything's clean all the time. Because the cleaner these machines are, the longer they will live, the more precise they will be in their measurements, and honestly, the happier your patients will be. Because if you walk into an exam room, if you're the patient and it's filthy, that says a lot. Some of it might be shouting at you, like, run out the door, right? Um, but primarily what we will use the patient table for is moving the table in and out of the gantry along specified incrementations. So it has to be very precise in the way that it moves. Um, sometimes this is called feeding it, step, index. I normally just call it move the table, right? Move the table into the gantry. Um, the degree to which the table can move is the scannable range, right? So it has a point at which it will stop. It also has a weight limit, right, beyond which you, sh you shall not go, right? Um, and, but this scan, scan limit is what determines uh, how far along the patient's anatomy you can go without repositioning. And that's going to be important because the positioning on the table, basically the table's landmarked to the machine. So as we move the table through the gantry, the gantry knows precisely where on the table it's at, right? So it can map that onto the patient's body, and that's a key part of how we do 3D imaging, it's a key part of how we do radiation treatment planning, it's a key part of how we do surgical planning, it's key to a lot of stuff, right? The last thing I'll say about the table is what the, my lead CT tech told me my first day on the job is there shall be no births, deaths, or conceptions on the patient table, right? Otherwise, anything else goes. I have spent many nights sleeping on the patient table, right, as a graveyard tech. So I made sure that place was spotless. All right. So <coughs> now, the table is landmarked. And we map that onto anatomic landmarks in the patient's body. And we sometimes refer to this as zeroing out the table or referencing the table. But most 
text just say zero the table, right? We will zero to some point on the patient's body, generally a piece of bony anatomy, right? So for example, for scanning a CT chest, the landmark might be the xiphoid process because it's palpable. The jugular notch just above the xiphoid process is palpable, right? That's a common place of zeroing out. If we're scanning the patient's head, we may zero out to basically the EAM, the external acoustic meatus, right? So being able to identify these bony landmarks is going to be helpful to us, right? Um, do we zero stuff in Nuke Med? Do they zero the, the table out to stuff? Not so much. Okay. Pay special attention when they're zeroing out. I don't mean to target y'all, but I think that Dr. Lastly pretty much drills down anatomic landmarks for, for therapy. And for, for us um, in x-ray, we have the idea of centering in the back of our minds, so we can kind of just apply centering out of zeroing, right? It's the same idea. Just from that point, when you tell the machine that's zero, all the movements it makes, it makes from that zero point. So it can go north of zero, it can go south of zero, right? And it's gonna read that out. Basically what you're declaring is this is isocenter. Right. This is isocenter. Everything originates and returns to this point. Follow the light. Right? Isn't that what they said? Follow the light or oh, go into the light. Um, if we do not correctly zero out our table, we can produce artifacts and increase patient dose. So while it may seem really, really simple, it's actually one of the most carefully engineered parts of the process is to appropriately zero your table. Um, in fact, it's so important, right, that the, de the designers of these machines have largely taken out of, of, taken it away from the text control. They said, y'all are too dumb, you can't figure out how to zero these tables out. But they know there's auto zeroing mechanisms embedded in a lot of new CT scanners, right? Because they recognize how, signi how significant the patient dose increase is and the artifacts as well. So miscentering, if we don't, if we do not center this thing appropriately to the gantry isocenter, um, and there's all sorts of research out there about how much miscentering would increase dose. I'm not really interested in these percentages. I don't think anyone is. Just know that it is a significant increase in surface dose and noise, miscentering by three centimeters, right? Um, largely that has to do with how high or low the table is centered, right? But it could be that the patient shifted slightly to the right or to the left, because basically we're shifting the center of gravity away from isocenter, right? Um, so it's not so much north to south, soup to imp on the patient's body that we're worried about. It's how high or how low are they in the scanner uh, gantry aperture. Oh, and uh, finally, this is going to be linked to degradation and the performance of the scanner's bow tie filter. So going back to the hot dog metaphor, so we've got this hot dog and we're trying to center the hot dog, right? And we've got this filter that's going to filter around the hot dog. I'll draw it in just a minute. It would matter if we don't have it centered appropriately. That's the references for this presentation here. <laughs>